Well, good morning, everyone. Um, what a beautiful Sunday morning. I got to tell you, it's so awesome to see the trees sprouting. And um, I like fall, but I have to say spring, I think, is my favorite season. I like the transition seasons. I like fall because, I, I mean, it's just, it's comfortable weather, but I know winter's coming. With spring, I know, even though I'm not a huge fan of the hot weather, I know that we have long days coming, and it's just, it kind of gives hope, you know? I mean, after a winter, and it's a long, dark season, it's just so nice to have spring come, and I just, I love it. And this morning was just spectacular, seeing the, the beautiful sun on the trees, so... I know usually I start a message with a joke, um, but I wanted to share, you know, a story that I had just heard recently. You know, we've heard about how to control, right? And, you know, we hear it all over the place. And so I found some encouraging news that, you know, people are actually being held accountable. And I heard about, um, I guess like a, it was a teenage boy that shoplifted a calendar and he got 12 months. And so I'm like, you know, I was just very encouraged that their people are being held accountable. Okay, all right. <laughs> now that we've got that out of the way, let's pray. Father, I do want to just thank you again for this morning. Beautiful Sunday morning. And I am just praying that your Holy Spirit would just fill this place, it would just be overwhelming that the words spoken are your words, that your scriptures, which is living and breathing, that you would just speak to us, the people who are watching online, those who will watch it a week or a month from now, I pray, Father, that your conviction, your correction, your inspiration would impact us all and that our hearts would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so when I was a kid, I was a kid of the 70s and early 80s, and I can remember when um, my dad was a school principal at a school in Lake Geneva, and when I was probably like, I'm going to say six, seven years old, I know this is hard to believe, but Legos were kind of a novelty at that time. And my dad brought home um, this box of Legos from school so I could like play with them. And there were different types of things, toys that I liked to play with as a kid. Legos was one, um, erector sets was another, tinker toys, but the granddaddy of them all was Lincoln Logs. Do you guys remember Lincoln Logs? Okay. Rachel got a picture of me last week playing with my Lincoln Logs. <laughs> and there is something about Lincoln Logs, I, I can't explain it. You know, of course it comes in that, that package, and you dump them out on the floor, and they had all the little pieces, like the corner pieces, the planks for the, um, the roof, then it had the long, long logs you used for like the wall. And I don't know why, but I was just enthralled with these things. And I would build these little towns with Lincoln Log houses, and then I would use the Tinker Toy, those thin little, um, like, straw-like things to make, like, I put my uh, matchbox cars, you know, and it was, I loved it. And our whole, like, living room was just like a big town, you know. And, but one of the things that is interesting about when you get toys like that when you dump it out on the floor, it's usually like chaos, right? I'm, I'm a very kind of OCD person, so I would always make sure that things were kind of categorized and these pieces of like were in that group and then you started kind of organizing it and then you started building uh, your structure. Well, we've been in the book of Acts for a while and it would be so wonderful to think that the church could be like that. But the fact is, it's not. And for those of us who have been seasoned Christians, and even people who are new to the church, you don't, it doesn't take long for you to figure out that the idea of a church, the idea of what we want it to be, it starts out simple, but it usually doesn't end that way. 
And I was having breakfast with a group of guys, and there happened to be a pastor there, and we were talking about the book of Acts. And he kind of had a smile on his face, and he's like, yeah, it's amazing how the intentions of the believer are so simple and pure, but it's not long before people get in the way. And I thought, wow, that is so apropos to what we're talking about today in the book of Acts, and we're in chapter 17. So I just want to tee this up a little bit, because there's a method that Paul and his helpers are using, and it ties into things that were talked about in the Old Testament, and then they transfer into the New Testament, and then they transfer into the time that you and I are living right now. Things that Paul was fighting against are very similar to the things that we're dealing with in this current age. The Greek culture was overwhelming during that time. We're talking about like paganism, idols. There's all these things that are happening. But then you um, compound it with all the things that are going on with uh, all these different Jewish sects, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, where the Pharisees, they're the scholar of the common man. Then you have the Sadducees, who were like the aristocrats. Um, their whole life evolved around the temple. They were the wealthy class. And you've got these two groups warring against each other. Then you have Paul coming into the equation where you've got this man, and there is no doubt in my mind that God handpicked this man. It's not a, 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 some random choice or some random act that this man was leading the charge of the church. This is a man who was an expert in Jewish law. He was taught under one of the most revered teachers of that time, Gamaliel. And I'm just going to put it simply, when it comes to like Jewish law, Jewish teaching, at that time, Paul was at the top of his game and really was kind of a rock star in that community. And then all of a sudden, God gets a hold of his heart, and the Jewish law isn't quite as important as now preaching a gospel where Jesus is the only way. And the book of Acts is kind of a catalog of politics. Okay, now, so I know that's a very dirty word, and we're not talking about the politics that we know here in the United States. Really, politics is, in a sense, kind of a scientific word, and all it is is man deciding who gets the power. So does man get the power? Does a certain group get the power? Does Jesus get the power? Man has to kind of decide this. And so you're seeing this whole mix someone dumping out all these pieces on the floor, and as the book of Acts starts to um, come into its own, you start to see the pieces being put together, kind of categorized on the floor, and then the church starts to be built. But, of course, we are free-willed beings. God doesn't want robots. He wants our hearts. And so we have that ability to make the decision who gets the power, and who doesn't in our life. So we're going to be from Acts 17. And uh, in starting in verse 1, when you read this, try to kind of look at it like these, these are normal people that God is using. And I think a lot of times I am guilty of this. When I, was, I grew up in the church, I think a lot of times we have a habit of being like, well, that's biblical history. No, this is history. This is during the time of, of areas of, of, of history that we learned about in school. This is like Paul is living this, trying to fight this world system with the gospel of Christ. But there are helpers that are going to come along like the Holy Spirit and people that God winds up using to encourage him, to aid him. But along the way, there are a lot of bumps and bruises. So look at this as you're dealing with people of all different personalities. They've got personality disorders. They've got 
all these different things, everything that you and I deal with right now. All right. So, in verse 1, they took the road south of Aphimopolis and Apollyana to Thessalonica. Now, that's going to be very important, where there was a community of Jews. Paul went to their meeting place, as he usually did, when he came to a town, and for three Sabbaths, that's also important, running, he preached to them from the scriptures. He opened up the text so that they understood what they had been reading all their lives, that the Messiah absolutely had to be put to death and raised from the dead. There were no other options, and that this Jesus I'm introducing to you is that Messiah. So some of them were won over and joined ranks with Paul and Silas. Among them, a great many God-fearing Greeks and a considerable number of women from the aristocracy. But the hardline Jews became furious over the conversations. Mad with jealousy, they rounded up a bunch of brawlers off the streets and soon had an ugly mob terrorizing the city as they hunted down Paul and Silas. All right, so the thing that you're kind of looking at here is Paul is kind of getting it from all sides, okay? He's familiar with all of these people who had the positions with the Jewish law. I mean, he, he knows these people. And it's amazing how God handpicks someone like Paul who had everything to lose from a worldly standpoint, nothing really to gain from a status standpoint, but he lets it all go, okay? And he is convinced that Jesus is the only way. There is no other way other than Jesus, and he's setting aside everything that he has known pretty much his entire life, including position, which is hard for anybody. On top of it, you've got this, these groups of people where they have like these prepackaged uh, beliefs, okay? Everything that they know, their identity, their living, all of their community, their sphere of influence is being threatened by this new uh, belief called the gospel. So Paul is sitting here trying to, I'm not going to say he's doing it on his own, but this guy is getting hit like hard, okay? And when we see the Holy Spirit start to take form with this church, this new community that no one really is aware of, it's that mystery that's talked about in the scriptures, the greatest global community the world has ever known, you're at the beginning of this process. And of course, there's going to be pushback. The world is always going to be pushing back. And those two groups, the world system, they're trying to hang on to whatever they can. It's, it's just a perfect powder keg for all sorts of things to happen. God somehow takes the chaos of man and the world and organizes it in such a way and makes it into an efficient thing that changes the world. And it's amazing how he can do that, but only God can do it. That's one of the reasons why during this um, uh, series, have you noticed that we are constantly saying prayer, Holy Spirit, the ultimate helper for the Christian. That has to be part of the ingredient in order for the church to be something that God can use to further his kingdom. Yes, he uses human beings. Yes, he uses our, our fleshly bodies. But the Christian walk is a spiritual walk. It's not a physical walk. And that's what Paul is really ultimately trying to challenge these people it's a spiritual walk. This is not a prepackaged religion. This isn't like a packet of Kool-Aid that you pour into um, you know, a pitcher of water. This is a living, breathing thing that God is using to impact the world. So I'm going to share a story with you. And this happened when I was back in high school. And I had a, a lawn mowing business with a group of friends and when it was dry during the season, we would kind of 
do other things while the grass wasn't growing. So one of the things we did was seal coating. And one of the other things we did is we would put ads in the local paper. Now at that time, people actually read newspapers. This is now probably mid, late 80s. And you would put an ad in the paper and you would say, hey, you know, guys looking for just general handyman work. And you would get a phone call and we got a call. And it happened to be a man who owned a bunch of little lakefront cab cabins down in Williams Bay. And the gutters needed to be repainted and they were completely coated in like mold, okay? So this was a job I was doing by myself. And I went down there and met the guy, he was an older gentleman. And uh, I had my radio with me and I turned on the radio and it was a, I don't know if it was Moody or WVCY, I don't know which one it was, but it was a Christian radio station. And lo and behold, we, he and I were working together on his cabins. And wouldn't you know it, that they were doing a like week-long expose on the Masons, okay? And I'm not talking about the bricklayer, I'm talking about the 32nd degree Masons, okay? I have no, I'm just listening to it, this guy's doing a great job. And it actually was pretty interesting. And so we finished that day of work. And I'm expecting to come back that next day because it was a big project. It was probably going to last several weeks. I get up early that, the next morning and um, I'm getting ready for work. And my dad comes into my room and he goes, there's, there's like an old man here to talk to you. I'm like, what? So I go to the front door, and sure enough, this man who I was working with the day before, he's like, I need to talk to you. I'm like, oh, okay. And he's like, it's nothing to do with your work. He hands me the money from the previous day's wages, and he's like, I'm sorry, but I can't have you do this job. And I'm like, well, why? And he goes, well... You know, you were listening to that radio station, and I was just so bothered. Like, I, I think he almost said he couldn't even sleep that night. And he goes, I'm, like, I'm a big part of the Masons, and I kind of remember seeing like, that symbol on the back of his Cadillac. And he's like, I'm sorry, I can't. You, you, I can't have anything to do with you. He goes, the Masons is like a huge part of my life, and I'm sorry, but we have to part ways, and here's your money, and I'm, I'm going to get someone else to do it. Now, I'll be honest, as like a 17-year-old kid, you're just like, oh, okay. And my, there was just like a pit in my stomach, and I'm thinking, holy cow, I did not see that coming. You'd think the story would end there, but it, but it doesn't, Okay. And you're going to see how God takes something that's chaotic and turns it into something that you could never imagine. And I'm going to come back to that story. All right. So, in verse 6. When they couldn't find them, they collared Jason and his friends instead of dra and dragged them before the city fathers, yelling hysterically, these people are out to destroy the world. And now they've shown up on our doorstep attacking everything we hold dear. So do you think maybe these people are a little intimidated and uh, are kind of feeling like, wow, everything that we've worked for, all of the facade that we've had, it's all kind of coming apart. That's, that's the Holy Spirit working right there. And Jason is, is hiding them. These traitors and turncoats who say Jesus is king and Caesar is nothing. The city fathers and the crowd of people were totally alarmed by what they heard. They made Jason and his friends post heavy bail and let them go while they investigated the charges. But that night, under the cover of darkness... Their friends got Paul and Silas out of town as fast as they could. They sent them to Berea, where they again met with the Jewish community. I want to just share something with you. That situation where it talks about Berea, 
There is a group of people called the Bereans who were noted for being the type of people who just didn't take someone's word when they heard about the gospel. They would go back to the scriptures. They would look to make sure that everything lined up with what Paul was saying. They made sure that just because someone in a position of authority said it, that they didn't just believe it. They were very aware of deception, something that believers in our time period are being warned about. Do not be deceived. And a lot of times as believers, I think we just take someone's word for it. And I, I'm going to tell you flat out, like Rachel and I have talked about this, I can't tell you the care that we take to make sure that what we're telling you is the truth because the judgment of teachers is going to be so much greater and I don't take it lightly at all. Like if you ever have a situation where you feel like, I don't know, Chris, then let's talk about it. Let's look at the scriptures because I don't want anyone after hearing a message of mine being like, I'm not so sure. That is something that I want to be as transparent as can possibly be. And this is kind of the first um, sign of people kind of saying to, to Paul, like, hey, I believe you, but let's just, let's trust but verify. You know, the famous Reagan words. I, we'll trust you, but let's verify it too, okay? So they treated, they were treated a lot better there than in Thessalonica. The Jews received Paul's message with enthusiasm and met with him daily, examining the scriptures to see if they supported what he said. Now, one of the things that I wanted to tell you why it was so important in the first verse about them going to Thessalonica, that was a major hub. That was a, a very um, well-known city. And so Paul had this method where when he shared the gospel, he would go to these larger towns first, okay? And he would bypass the smaller ones because he felt that if he could um, garner the trust, get the larger towns to get on board with the gospel, that they would eventually send out missionaries to the other surrounding areas. Paul is an interesting character. I would envision him being very stubborn, I would envision him being um, kind of OCD. He had this method that he was not going to let it go. I would envision him being someone who would be like, if someone kind of tested his patience or was like, well, I think we should go this way, whether right or wrong, I think he had a personality where it's like, no, I'm sorry, this is my conviction, this is what God's telling me to do, and I'm going to do it regardless of whether people like it or not. And I can respect that. So you're seeing these personalities kind of play out. So with the help of his friends in verse 14, Paul gave them the slip, caught a boat, and put out to sea. Silas and Timothy stayed behind. The men who helped Paul escape got him as far as Athens and left him there. Paul sent word back with them to Silas and Timothy, come as quick as you can. You know, it's been interesting. Um, just in the last few months, you know, we've had this really wet winter and it's amazing to kind of see these uh, newspaper articles about very iconic bodies of water like out west and even the Mississippi where we had that really dry summer and things were starting to kind of dry up. Now that we've had this wet winter, you're starting to see these like Lake Mead and the Mississippi starting to come back uh, to life. When I was a young kid, um, my brother worked for WGN. He actually produced the Cubs games. In 1984, they were in the pennant race against the St. Louis Cardinals. And as a kid, I got to go down with my brother and my parents to St. Louis. I had never been there before. Awesome city. And uh, at that time, they had a McDonald's uh, in a riverboat 
right on the Mississippi in front of the arch, okay? Now, I had never seen the Mississippi, and for those of you who have seen it, I mean, there's certain, there's areas where it's bigger and smaller, but I mean, that is a, that is an incredible body of water. But one of the things that's so interesting about it is you've got 250 tributaries, which is, I mean, you've got some creeks that are like the size of this table, then you've got rivers, and they're all pouring into this river, okay? And yeah, and you've got something like that, as small as that, and then you've got like major rivers flowing into this thing. One of the things that makes our country so unique and a superpower is that there is so much commerce that is done on that single river, okay? So you've got this chaotic um, system of all these water uh, sources pouring in to this one river that's at the heart of our nation. And I just want to share some stats with you about the Mississippi River, okay? So 250 tributaries, it is 2,350 miles long. In the Mississippi River Basin, 32 states are part of that kind of eco-community and two Canadian provinces. 92% of our nation's agricultural exports go through that river. And 78% of the world's exports in feed and grain and soybeans go through that river. But see, here's the thing. If it wasn't for all of these small waterways feeding into this river, it would not be the mighty Mississippi, okay? So you've got all sorts of different types of things flowing into it but at the end of, the, at the end of the, that, that tributary is this incredible community of water, if there's a lack of a better term, that's a powerhouse. That's the church. And it would not be that if it wasn't for all of those things feeding into it. So you've got different personalities. You've got different gifts, right? Um, and it's not perfect, it doesn't always flow perfectly, but the impact of that body of water not only blesses our nation, but the world. And I thought it was kind of interesting because our church is called the river. And I'm just saying to you, sometimes when we look at things that aren't as organized, that aren't perfect as we would like them to be, God somehow still uses it to impact the world. All right, so I want to go back to that story with that man. So I was, um, I had never heard from him again, and I was in a small group. At the time that that happened originally, I was a teenager. By the time I heard about this man again, I was newly married, and the, the, the River Church actually was just in its infancy, and we had um, a men's group that was meeting. And someone had mentioned a story that they had heard, and I don't know if it was their kids that met this man again, or grandkids, but they talked about a guy who lived in the Bay, and these kids went, and I think they might have worked at his property again, and they had shared that they were born-again Christians. And this man shared with them and said, I remember many years ago a, um, a young man working at my cabins, and I was so upset with him because of the fact that he didn't think that the Masons was like this great group and, and it was such a big part of his life. And the man never forgot it. And I think there is a strong possibility, you got to understand, this is many years ago, where I think he might have become a believer because the seeds were planted during a time when I met him 
And of course, I kind of blew up his whole system of thinking. The chaos ensued, and he was angry. And I'm going to tell you, when I saw him that next day, you could see on his face. I, I've got to tell you, I think he wanted to like hit me right in the nose. I mean, I think he was pretty upset with what that radio station was saying. Now, do I think that was by coincidence? No way. <laughs> no way. No way would I have known that that radio station was going to do an expose on the Masons. No way would I know that this man was a high up Mason member. And then there's no way that I would know that kids who were believers would eventually visit him probably 10, 15 years later and talk about the gospel. And I shared the fact that I knew who this man was and these people's jaws dropped. And they're like, holy cow, how does that stuff happen? And I do believe that that man um, did make a spiritual decision. You see, man creates chaos because we're sinful. We want our own way. And the fact is, we do get in the way. There are times I look at some of the things that I've seen happen in the church. My parents were leaders in the church that I grew up in. And sometimes I say to myself, why does God use us? It would be so much easier if it was just kind of like, I'm sure there are many times where God wanted to take Chris Johnson, grab him by the thing, here, let me just move you over here, and then I'm going to take care of it. But see, he doesn't do that. He uses us because we have free will to make the decisions. And a lot of times we like to make things so much more complicated not only in our Christian life, but even in our personal life. I do it. Believe me, I do it. And sometimes I look at myself and I'm like, why, why do, Chris, why do you make it so hard? Just, it's this, just make it simple. But we're weak, fallen, sinful people. That's why. And God somehow chooses to use us. And I'll tell you, like I said, again, sometimes I don't know why he does. And even people who are, were unbelievable icons of the faith. I think of King David, okay? I mean, you talk about a man who was messed up, but he had a, God, he had a heart after God's own heart, and God used him. There are so many examples of that where man gets in the way and God somehow saves the day every single time. And the book of Acts is a catalog of that happening all the time. Man gets in the way, God comes in, uses the Holy Spirit, the conviction of hearts, and somehow the kingdom just keeps building and building and building. You remember when we were talking uh, about a month ago where and I had those pictures of um, uh, the fire, right? So you try to like stomp a fire when you uh, are burning leaves, you use a rake, and all of a sudden those embers just fly everywhere. And remember we saw that picture where those people were out in that field, and I mean, it's just like, there's no way you're going to stop this. So the fire spreads, but then God, it's, it's chaos, and then all of a sudden order comes into play, and it's like, it's like that river, you know? All of a sudden this thing is just this body of water that offers nothing but life, and commerce, and meaning, and then it blesses the rest of the world. That's how we've got to look at the church. It's imperfect, it's not um, exact, but God still uses it anyways. All right, so let's finish up these scriptures. So the longer Paul waited in Athens for Silas and Timothy, the angrier he got all those idols, remember the Greek, the Greek culture is like overwhelming. It is paganism on, on steroids. I'm so glad that we don't live that, you know. So, the city was a junkyard of idols. He discussed it with the Jews and other like-minded people at their meeting place. And every day he went out on the streets and talked with anyone who happened to come along. Here's the thing. We are looking in the book of Acts at a time when the church is at its infancy. The, it, we're in a time of grace, the church age. So 2,000 years now has passed. 
And I'm going to just kind of say it like in, a, in an American way that everyone can understand. This is the beginning of the church age. We are now living at the end of the church age. We're at that point where you're at a professional athletic sporting event where it could go, it's the last, the last um, seconds, it's tied or you know, your, uh, your team is one point behind and they have the chance to win the game. And you've got the, um, the couple that, oh, the annoying couple that always brings like the newborn baby to like a movie or a sporting event and the kid's crying is, you know, crying like his head off. Then you got the, the drunk behind you that's pouring the beer over your shoulder and the kid throwing the popcorn and the police coming to drag out the hooligans. And all you want to do is just watch the game. Once, you know, a few seconds left, this could be it. Guys, that's where we're at, at in the church age. We're at the end. And what was originally made to be very simple over the course of all those years Man has made it complex. But the gospel's never changed, okay? And I'm just going to say to you, when we were in the book of John, where it says, Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. That could not be any more simpler. There is no other way. There is no other ways, way, it's Jesus, and that's it. But the church has made it complex, inserted what they think should be happening, and the fact of the matter is, is that the Christian faith is not social justice, it's not politics, it's not economics, it's not even boycotting a popular beer right now. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go on and you'll figure it out. It is about Jesus and Jesus alone. It is a personal relationship with Jesus. And if you do not have that, you've got to do it today. Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And Jesus' return for the church is imminent, which means it could happen five seconds from now. And I'm just going to tell you, please, you've got to make that decision. There is no other way. It is Jesus and Jesus alone, and that is it. And the gospel is clear. I'm going to leave you with this. All right. So there was a man during the late 1800s. His name was Alfred, okay? He was a, a Swedish chemist. And he came, his family was pretty amazing. I mean, they, they were kind of inventors. Um, they also uh, were very wealthy. And this particular man, at this time, I don't know if like when you watch like uh, country western um, movies, nitroglycerin, you know, like that's kind of what was the popular explosive at that time, and you would see it like in these clear bottles, and they'd be like, oh my gosh, you can't like shake the, the stagecoach, and it'll blow up. Okay, so this particular man, they had one of those factories, and this man's brother was working in that factory, and, and he was killed, because of the nitroglycerin, how unstable it was. So this Alfred came up with this way of taking the same um, explosive uh, source as nitroglycerin, but putting it into a dry state, which we now know as dynamite. Okay, so you could hold it, you could, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about it shaking and, you know, exploding. So, of course, this was used for civilian purposes, right? Mining, whatever else. But, of course, it was also used in the military. I mean, man always finds a way to use things to kill people. I mean, that's just, that just seems to be the hobby. Well, this man's brother, he had an, another brother who passed away, okay? And this is a pretty well-known family. And he opens up the paper one day and sees the obituary but the obituary wasn't about his brother, it was about him. And he's sitting here reading this thinking, oh, well, this is going to be kind of interesting. And so it talks about nothing positive that this man did, that he was like the merchant of death and that the invention of dynamite had killed so many people and that 
he had also created like military explosive products. And he's sitting there thinking to himself like, okay, well, you get the whole obituary thing squared away, but he's like, this isn't what I want to be remembered for. This is like, this shows my life like it's some crazy, like I'm just some greedy capitalistic and everything that I've profited off of was like this um, complete chaotic um, killing machine that was not my intention at all. Well, he winds up taking all of his wealth and creates this organization which uh, encouraged peaceful means of impacting the world. And this man's last name was Nobel, Alfred Nobel. So something out of chaos creates something that impacted the world in an amazing way because of something in an obituary. Life happens, and sometimes the four-letter word of life can sometimes be worse than the other four-letter word that goes into that sentence. We all know what that is. It is a chaotic show of crazy because we live in a fallen world. I mean, I listened to like the prayer requests that we had this morning, and you've got... Um, physical ailments and people who are needing transplants and people who have had transplants that are struggling and then you've got marriage issues and you've got, I mean, it, it just, it, it's broken. It is literally broken. And somehow God takes that brokenness, I don't know how he does, and he uses it with the Holy Spirit to positively impact the world and to further his kingdom. And as we continue in Acts, we're going to see how he uses very broken and imperfect people to keep furthering the kingdom. I don't think any of these people could ever imagined what the church became um, 2,000 years later. And we've had, the, and, and we've had the, the benefit of having a published Bible and seeing God use just amazing people in a very imperfect world. So be encouraged, preach the gospel, pray for neighbors, coworkers, family members. I'm doing it. I'm even praying for people I don't even like. And I got to tell you, five years ago, I probably wouldn't have done that, but I am now. I see people walking on our street that I don't like, and I'm like, Jesus, I pray that he would know you. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, as hardened of a heart as I have, only the Holy Spirit can do that. So I don't take any credit for it whatsoever. All right. So as we are going to do communion, this is the, the ultimate sacrifice, the way we respect what Jesus did for us. So I'm just going to ask before you come up, just examine your heart. Please that things are right as best as possible. This is a reverent moment where we can honor the sacrifice of what Jesus did for us. And come up when you're ready. I'm not sure who's doing it, but whoever is, they're ready to go.